Oh dear. I suspect most people fail this project right here. The largest, most difficult casting of the whole home-built lathe project. The bed. It might seem unwise to put a massive roadblock like right at the beginning of a journey or like putting the boss, the final boss, at the beginning of the game right after the tutorial mission. But think about it this way. If you can get through this, the rest of it is easy sailing. No, it's not. That's wrong. It's less hard. And this has to be here. Everything else depends on this casting. It's, it's the backbone that everything sits on. So don't get discouraged. It didn't go perfectly for me either but I'll show you how I did it. If you're more experienced in metal casting, I'm gonna be going over some, some basic stuff for the newbies, so just daydream till I'm through that part. And I'm gonna focus mainly on the way my project differs from what the book says, so anyone following along can you know decide to follow me or the book, whatever. So the preliminary thing that didn't go perfectly was the pronunciation of the author's name. See, I said gingery, and I had tons of comments giving me half a dozen different correct ways uh, of pronouncing it, but at least they all agreed, I'm doing it wrong. Gingery had the most votes, so I guess I'll do it that way from now on. If it's still wrong, feel free to keep telling me about it in the comments over and over. I'm sure that'll never get old. Now, we're starting the lathe bed, and I got nothing. We need to cast a piece for this. So to cast something, you need a pattern. Here's mine. It's built somewhat like the one in the book. You know, a little over two feet long, got plenty of draft. It's got these three braces that are in the gingery pattern. Uh, but mine differs in that it's two inches tall instead of an inch and a half, and I use three eighth inch thick wood instead of quarter inch. Uh, this is built out of uh, Home Depot cheapo wood, probably poplar. I built this years ago. I don't have any video of me making this. But if I had to do it again, it would probably be something uh, more like, like cherry, something harder. So if some idiot hits it with the sand rammer later, uh, it doesn't cause like dents in there. But building it's not enough. You gotta sand the thing smooth uh, and you add fillets. The book talks about this. Fillet is basically like inside you got these corners, right? They're harsh corners in there. You wanna round those out. Gingery suggests using car body filler like Bondo, but I hate Bondo and Bondo dust hates me too. Feelings mutual. Uh, you might think wood filler. Wood filler is really difficult to like get in there and smooth in like a smooth way. It really requires a lot of sanding and it's kind of difficult to sand up in those corners. So the best tip I got, thanks to Chirpy for this, is water putty. It comes in these cans, it comes dry, it's got the, the picture of this dude wearing spandex flexing on us all, so you know it's good. So you mix it up, you spread it on. He's, uh, he suggested using a popsicle stick, that round edge. If you run that round edge along the corner, it'll give you a nice radius. I couldn't find a popsicle stick, so I would suggest take a vinyl glove, stick it on your hand, and use the tip of your finger. The glove is plastic and it guarantees the putty won't want to stick to your finger. Well, with that plastic glove, it slides over and gives you a nice rounded edge. It's kind of handy, try it out. If you love breathing Bondo dust though, by all means, go for it. And then, when you got that done, finish the whole thing in shellac. Standard de-wax shellac, just from the hardware store. Don't use polyurethane with water putty, so I'm told. Uh, use shellac, always shellac. I tried this whole thing before with an unfinished pattern and it didn't go well. A little bit of extra care and attention to finish the pattern and smooth it all out will save you from a couple of failed ram ups and then going back and needing to finish it the proper way anyway before doing it successfully, like some people, it's me, I'm the people. So to ram up this pattern, you need some flasks. Those are the wood boxes. I made a video a while back about these boxes, the flasks that I'm using right here. I'm not gonna go over it. You can watch the video on those. There's also plans in the book. They're, they're fine too. I would suggest adding two inches of width to the flasks in the book. You'll see why later. Otherwise, this plan isn't bad. You can go for that one. Now for gating. Gating is how the metal gets from the crucible that you're pouring into the pattern. There's like the channels and stuff. Gingery has you cut a big hole right in the top and you dump the metal straight in. Don't do that. That churns up and all the oxides get mixed in there. The, the metal going down the hole is like a venturi. It sucks air in, churns it all up and mixes sand all in there. It's not a good time. It's only advantage is simplicity. It feeds the thing automatically while it's cooling and it doesn't take up a lot of metal in the runners, which is why he says he did it, because this is there's a lot of metal needed for this. But I'm not gonna do that. Sure, countless people have done it by the book, and their lathes make chips just fine. But I have a pathological need to complicate things for no gain. So I rammed it up in the flask, not in the middle, but off center a bit. Don't move it too far over. You need enough sand along the edge to make sure the, the metal doesn't leak out. And I rammed the top flask, called a cope, with just the pattern in it. This is gonna be a false cope, which means you're gonna knock it out later, but still ram it up like nice and tight, right? 
Now, you get it all rammed up, flip it over, leave the pattern in there. You see these openings in the bottom of the pattern? You want to make sure and get parting powder down in there. I use uh, talc, Johnson & Johnson baby powder, just standard talc. I don't know if that new like cornstarch baby powder will work, I'm not really sure. But this was made after the whole asbestos in the baby powder debacle, so hopefully this doesn't have asbestos in it. Either way, don't breathe powder in anything. It's, it's a bad, it's a bad idea. What that does is it prevents the sand from sticking to everything. Make sure to get it all over the sand too, so the sand you put on top doesn't stick to the stuff on the bottom. I'm using Petrobon sand, it's super sticky. You need this stuff to make sure they don't just fuse together. My plan here is to run the metal alongside the mold, and I'm going to feed it in at each of these three braces. That way the metal can enter the pattern and go all the way to the opposite side right away. I 3D printed all these runners, the spin trap, all that. This did not go super perfectly. Just know you don't need all these fancy extra bits. People have cut channels with spoons for a long time perfectly successfully. I used to use a copper pipe. These runners, the cross-sectional area is about the same as a half-inch copper pipe. I usually use much smaller runners than that, but I usually make much smaller castings than this, so there's that. I will likely talk about gating and runners and stuff a little more in the, in the future in maybe a different video. Just know the main goal I have is to uh, slow the metal down, prevent turbulence and uh, shrinkage, and don't let air get sucked in there when you're pouring in the sprue. I do not always succeed on all these points, but I try, especially the shrinkage. Shrinkage bothers me. If you're using aluminum or a metal that isn't like ZA8, 12, or 27, uh, just take your pattern and stick a couple big old feeders right on top. Maybe line them up on top of these, these braces. Uh, get, get a little channel to connect the metal, and you're done. No worries. I, however, am using ZA12. So if you're using the same metal as I am, listen up. This metal is weird. Uh, to explain how weird it is, I'm going to have to get a little bit nerdy, but I'll try to keep it light. This metal is hyper-eutectic. A eutectic is a mix of two things, like two metals in this case, where the melting point is lower than either of the two component melting points. Think like solid ice, you add solid salt, you get liquid salty water. Aluminum and zinc are kind of the same. You take zinc, add a little bit of aluminum, which is a hotter melting temperature, but instead of raising the melting point, the melting point drops to a point. It's like, I think it's around 5% aluminum or something. I might be wrong there. Uh, if you keep adding more aluminum, which ZA12 has, it's like 11% aluminum, the melting point goes back up. But it's not just that. Instead of transitioning from liquid to solid, it goes liquid slushy stuff solid. The slushy stuff is kind of a mix of like liquidy solidy stuff. Now the more solid part of the slushy stuff has more aluminum content in it. That's why it's freezing first. But aluminum is much less dense than zinc, so it floats. So you end up with all the stuff that's freezing floating, causing this metal to freeze from top down. You end up with this weird, this weird situation where the top part has a higher aluminum content than the bottom part. This is especially bad in ZA27. So consider this when you're designing your own gating system. It's gonna freeze top down. I tried to feed from the bottom using feeders that were off to the side, molded from these things. It didn't work. My final result is usable though, so I'm not doing it again. If this were a smaller part, I would like do it over and over until it was perfect, but no. I'm gonna take the ugly side of this casting and it's gonna be the back, and I'm not gonna have to see it anymore. Problem solved. Now when I got the thing all rammed up, smoothed the top off, I stuck on a thing that I made, formed using a 3D printed part, still working on the details there, bear with me. Uh, and it's basically a pouring basin and the sprue lines up. These should probably be made out of sodium silicate. I used Petrobond, which is a problem, and you're gonna see why later. Now Gingri uses a full quart to fill his pattern. My pattern's thicker, and I got extra runners and feeders and stuff. So I have this crucible here, Urgh! which I tested and it comfortably holds a quart and a half with, with some, some room to spare. I didn't use this one. I used this one. You can almost wear this one on your head if you want to look particularly stupid for some reason. I filled that thing just about to the top. Now I don't know what half a gallon of zinc is supposed to weigh, but it doesn't feel very good when it's on the end of the tongs, like the end of a pole. That's got a lot of leverage against you. Before you do this, before you turn on the burner, take your big crucible, fill it up with a ton of heavy, the heavy zinc metal or whatever, and do some handling tests to make sure you're not just gonna dump all the metal all over the floor and your feet and stuff. Try to do test runs or stuff. It might, might prevent third degree burns later. Remember, none of this is safe. Do at your own risk and very much don't copy me most of the time. It's a bad idea. If you wanna know what size these crucibles are, this one here, the smaller one, has a number eight stamped in it. And this larger one here, which I bought from the same place, has a number eight stamped in it. 
which is helpful. And when you pour, you better start, keep that pouring basin full, and don't stop until the mold stops taking metal or your crucible runs out. Hopefully the first one. Now I had a problem where I was holding it as low as possible because you don't want the metal like pouring down a whole bunch of distance into this thing. You basically want the metal down as far as possible, tip it in. That's kind of why I'm raising up the, the pouring basin. It's entirely to make it easier to dump in with the crucible, not because higher is better. But because this thing is so heavy on the end of the tongs and because I'm a weakling, I ended up bumping the side of the, the soft Petrobon pouring basin and I broke it and a bunch of zinc spilled out of it onto the floor. Fortunately, zinc is pretty low temperature, so the concrete didn't even notice. But if this was bronze, I would have some serious damage here. So if you're gonna do metal casting around you, make a bed on the ground with sand in it, put the flask on top. So when you're dumping the metal, the metal leaks out, it lands on sand not concrete. You don't end up with steam explosions, which I didn't. I do, however, cast stuff in bronze all the time. So uh, yeah, maybe that's next on my build list. This thing took so very much metal. I certainly was not worried that it didn't fill all the way, though my spine worried about lifting the flask after I was done. And if you're wondering what the big brass bar on the top there, that's to stop the metal from floating the top flask up off the bottom one. It's a little unnecessary because these flasks screw together but still not a bad idea to put some weight on top. Sometimes you'll see like concrete weights or whatever set on top of flasks, that's why. The next day, I took the thing out of the sand and uh, whoo, only a few things went wrong. This is straight out of the sand. I didn't do anything to it except knock all the sand off and a couple of these little vent wires broke off. This is because the metal is so fluid when it gets to the little vents that I poked with a TIG filler rod, it just filled up the rod. And first off, this finish is pretty smooth. It's almost impossible to get this, this camera to focus on this metal because it's so shiny. But I got nice crisp edges. I don't have any major lumps of sand or air pockets visible. I got a little bit of flashing. This is where the metal went in, ran down the runners. There's a spin trap. There is some flashing down there. But there is a problem. <laughs> you can see the tops of the feeders aren't really sunken in. You kind of hope they would be. Uh, I think what happened was this in gate here, this knife gate, froze first or the part ended up feeding the feeders or something this this did not work out so if i had to do these again they would be wider much taller this would be thicker you know or, or maybe just don't bother who knows probably don't need the spin trap for this i just kind of did that out of habit and because i printed it next time i'm gonna i'm gonna start by cutting all this off and try to finish it up and then start scraping so we'll see more in detail if there's any damage inside there Ugh. Man, that thing is That's heavy. A dent. Not bad, huh? Ram. Except for that Showed dent. Up in the casting. But otherwise, pretty smooth. Okay, so that's step one half done. I got the I got the casting done. The major roadblock has been surpassed. The boss has been defeated, and it's on to more exciting things like hand scraping the top of this thing dead flat. Oh goody. 